good morning, everybody, and welcome to our online service. You know, last week was the first week we tried this, but we've been able to now stream our online service, as you know, on YouTube and now on our Facebook page. And so whatever platform you're using to tune in this morning, we welcome you. And uh, we're, we're so glad that you're able to tune in and be with us this morning. Well, let's open up the service now with a word of prayer. We got some great praise reports. Uh, some people that have been really sick with COVID uh, are getting better. We're getting good reports. Uh, I got a report last night. Helen Butterfly is doing much better. Uh, her kidneys are beginning to work again. So we're seeing God really move in some great ways in people's lives, not just in, on the spiritual level, but physically. Uh, people have gotten uh, miraculous touches from God. And so we just want to give him some praise before we get into the praise and worship. And then we'll turn the service over to Ben. We'll come back after worship and we'll get into the Word of God together. But let's open with prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, I thank you for what you're doing in lives. I thank you, Lord, that you are healing people. I thank you that you're restoring people. Those who are sick, God, you're restoring them back to fullness of health. Lord, those who are staring death in the face, Lord, I thank you that you are restoring them to fullness of health. You're bringing them back to their families. God, I thank you for what you're doing. Lord, this morning as we gather, we just want to worship you. We want to praise you. We ask, Lord, that your presence would change the atmosphere wherever we happen to be in our homes, workplaces, wherever we happen to be watching or listening to this. God, we pray that you would change the atmosphere where we are. We want to connect with you today. We want to experience you today, and we want you to experience us as we open our hearts to you. And we pray all this in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen. Well, we're going to turn the service over to Ben. He's going to play some songs. I just encourage you to open your heart to worship God. And, uh, and let's see what God does in the atmosphere of our homes or wherever we happen to be as we sing these praise songs to him, as we worship him. Let's, uh, let's, let's give him our whole heart here for the next few minutes. And then we'll come back together and we'll get into the word of God together. Out this fire tonight is burning in my spirit. I'm gonna dance with all my might. I don't care who sees it. I'm gonna let it wild be just like a child. Say, I love you, Lord. I might make a scene tonight, I might come unraveled. Gonna get undignified, breaking off these shackles. Gonna let it wild, be just like a child. Say, I love you, Lord. I love you. Oh, 
It won't prevail Cause the God I serve Knows only how to triumph My God will never fail My God will never fail I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle Backing down from any giants, I know how this story ends. I know how this story ends. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory for the battle.
His favor be upon you and a thousand generations in your family and your children and their children and their children. May His favor be upon you and a thousand generations in your family and your children and their children and their children. May His favor be upon you and a thousand generations in your family and your children and their children and their children. May His favor be upon you and a thousand generations in your family and your children and their children and their children. May His favor be upon you and a thousand generations in your family and your children and their children and their children. May His presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening and you're coming and you're going and you're weeping and rejoicing he is for you he is for you he is for you he is for you
Well, Ben, thank you so much for putting these worship songs together for us and, uh, and making your spiritual gift accessible to the whole church family. You know, the rest of us that don't have these skills and this gift, uh, we're, we're able to use what God's placed in your life as a, uh, a way to, for us to connect to God in a very real and personal manner. And that's, uh, that's a real blessing. So thank you so much for doing this. Well, today we're going to get into 1 Thessalonians, so I want you to find your Bible, get your tablet, your phone, whatever uh, app you use to, uh, to read the scriptures. But I want you to get your Bible out, and we're going to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Put a marker there, if you would, and then go over to the book of Acts chapter 17, because we're going to look at some verses there at the beginning as well. Uh, we're going to, we're, we've been trying to go through the book of 1 Thessalonians, one chapter each week, and so today we're going to get into the third chapter, which gives us a look at the vital signs of a healthy end times follower of Jesus. What, you know, the whole book gives us, I think, a portrait of what an end times believer looks like. What, what is Jesus looking for in the people that he's returning for is, I think, a really good overall theme for the book. But what we're going to look at today is, well, you know, if, if Jesus were to come and check our vital signs, what would he check? And so we're going to look at that today in the message. So let's go ahead and open up with a word of prayer, and let's ask God to speak to our hearts. Let's ask him to show us the things he wants us to see and to respond in the way he wants us to respond to him. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your instruction. I thank you that your heart is made known to us in this book, the Bible. Lord, I ask that you would speak to each and every one of our hearts today. Give us understanding of your word and your ways. Equip us to follow you more. And we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, give us the courage to respond in the way that you want us to respond to your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, as I said last week, we finished up 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And so we took special note in that chapter of how Paul was unwillingly, and uh, he, he really didn't want this to happen, but he was uh, forced out of Thessalonica. And so we, we talked about the, how this unwanted separation from the people that he really cares about and loves in the city of Thessalonica, it, uh, it kind of parallels, in a sense, what we all experience and, and what we encounter in our lives when we have someone that we really love and trust, care about, someone who's close to us when they pass away. And so we talked about that at the end of uh, last week's message because each and every one of us, I think, at some point in our life, we feel or, or we encounter that painful emotion, that gut-wrenching emotion of having someone that we love separated from our life. And uh, so what we did last week was we looked at how Paul's been taken out of this community for a season and how he's been separated for a season. It hurts. He wants to be reunited with them. But there's a parallel in that because just how we get unwillingly separated from people that we love and care about in our life, that separation is temporary. Paul, at some point, he's going to get to go back and be reunited with the people that he was separated from, just like you and I are going to get reunited with the people that we've been separated from. And so there's an interesting type, analogy, or parallel here. And so uh, we, we kind of built on that a little bit last week, focusing on the idea how for the believer, this separation, it is temporary. If that person has a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ, the truth is they actually have gone on to be with the Lord. See, the Bible doesn't describe the death of the believer in Jesus uh, the same way it describes the death of a person who does not have a relationship with God through Jesus. See, the Bible describes us as having died and having our life hidden with Christ in God, it says in, in Colossians. It, it describes us as having that happen, passing from death into life, as Jesus says in John chapter 5. That happens when we first put our trust, when we commit all of our life to Christ's care and control. We, when we die to ourselves, as it were, we come alive in him never to die. And so when this physical body wears out, I t my, my heart stops beating. My brain activity ceases in this body. When I take that last breath in this body, I immediately transition to be with the Lord. It's as though there's no gap. So it, it's really kind of a misnomer to say that that Christian died because that person died when they came to Christ. When this earth suit wears out, 
we immediately transition to be with the Lord. And so for the believer, they're alive. They have fellowship with Jesus in the presence of God, just like we live here in these earth suits and we have a relationship with Jesus and we enjoy the presence of God, though not to the degree that our loved ones who have gone on experience with him. They're still alive. They're encountering Jesus. We're still alive. We're encountering Jesus. And the central figure in all of this is Jesus. The thing is that we just can't interact with those who have crossed over, if we could use that terminology. So I can't interact with my mom like I used to. So I'm experiencing a time of of separation, but that time is temporary. And that's what's really helpful to keep in view. So we're separated from, from those loved ones for a season. And that season of separation ends when Jesus returns. There's an amazing reunion coming. And uh, I like to put it this way, the emotions that you feel or that you felt when that separation first occurred, I want you to reverse those emotions around 180 degrees and that's what it's going to feel like, even more joyous. It's going to feel like when we get reunited and that reuniting happens when Jesus returns. And so we talked about that last week. Now let's get into chapter three. That brings us up to date here. Timothy's mission, the first five verses of 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 describe how Paul sends Timothy on a return mission to Thessalonica for a short visit. So we're going to look at that here in verse 1. Therefore, when we could endure it no longer, we thought it best to be left behind at Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, our brother and God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith. So that no one would be disturbed by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that we have been destined for this. Timothy's mission, we talk about this here because I think his mission is, uh, there's some nuggets in here that we want to take note of. But I think we'll learn more about this if we look at Timothy's mission in the context provided for us in the book of Acts. So I told you at the beginning, put your finger in uh, 1 Thessalonians 3. We're going to look at that, but also look up Acts 17. So turn over to Acts 17, because in verses 1 to 9, it describes how that church got first planted in Thessalonica by Paul. And we read those verses last week. We know that Paul was only there for a short time, perhaps as as short a time as three weeks. I think it was a little bit longer than the three weeks that we know he was there. I think maybe a month or two, but probably not more than that. So his ministry in Thessalonica got cut short. And the reason for that, uh, that truncation of his time of ministry there was because of the severe persecution that arose against the newly planted church in Thessalonica. His his friends and other people in the church were afraid he was going to get lynched, so they get him out of town. And we brought uh, the 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 reading of Acts 17 up to verse 10 last week, just to kind of give you that context. And so what we'll do here is we'll pick it up in verse 10, and we'll read a little bit further because then we'll see how Timothy's mission is going to mesh with what Luke tells us back in Acts 17. It says in verse 10, the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night. That tells me that, you know, his, his departure, it was, it was uh, in haste. They, uh, they had to, to smuggle him out of the city. It's not the first time he has to be smuggled out of a city because of a mob wanting to uh, put him to death on sight. And so they, they bring him out of the city by night to Berea, which is a city just down the road from Thessalonica. And when they arrived there, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. And it's like, hey, there's, they don't miss a beat. They start over again in this new city of Berea. Now, these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. I think this uh, passage gives us a really useful template for our lives. What he's basically saying there is, hey, don't take Joel's word for granted. Don't, don't believe necessarily what I'm saying that the Bible means, but actually take what your pastor, your preacher uh, that you're listening to, the evangelist that you're listening to, whatever, take what they're saying about the Word of God, then examine the Scriptures and check it out for yourself. That's a really noble-minded approach. I think that's a very good and wholesome 
approach to the scriptures. And so those in Thessalonica, they, uh, they, there is an immediate rejection in the hearts of, of many people of the word of God. Some of that had been brought up in the synagogue, rejected the word of God out of hand, but in Berea, they were more noble-minded. They examined the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Look at the next verse and you see the result of that approach. It says, therefore, many of them believed along with a number of prominent Greek women and men. But when the Jews of Thessalonica found that the word of God had been proclaimed by Paul in Berea, they came there as well, agitating and stirring up the crowds. And so it starts all over again. These people from the city up the road, they're, they're going to dog him now in, uh, in Berea and, and cause a persecution to arise there. So let's just kind of bring things up to speed here. As you can see on the map there, uh, Thessalonica is kind of up in the, the, the upper left-hand corner of that map. And in Acts 17, verses 14 and 15, which we're going to read in just a second, we're going to read about how fresh opposition once again compels Paul to move his base of ministry. And he moves it down the road from uh, Thessalonica to Berea. But where he's also going to have to transition from Berea because the persecution that starts up there becomes very intense. And again, there's like a, we, we don't know if they put a bounty on his head. At some point later on in the book of Acts, there is a bounty, a price on his head. But um, apparently there is a, a severe enough of a threat that they were compelled to take Paul and uh, bring him all the way down south to Athens. And so it says in verse 14, then immediately the brethren sent Paul out as far as the sea and he probably, he probably uh, is able to take voyage on a ship from there. But Silas and Timothy remain there. This is what I wanted you to see. Silas and Timothy as traveling companions who helped plant the church in Thessalonica. They end up staying behind in Berea. Now those who escorted Paul brought him as far as Athens. And receiving a command from Silas and Timothy, uh, a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they left. So Paul's left in the city of Athens. Maybe he has a couple companions with him, but for all intents and purposes, he's left there by himself. He gives instructions for Silas and Timothy to catch up with him. But you need to understand something that Paul is left alone in Athens, and Athens is about 300 miles south of Thessalonica. This is uh, not a trivial distance, especially considering the speed of travel and communications in that day. It's probably going to be several months before they are able to be reunited. So Timothy and Silas, they remain behind way up north. Paul sends instructions for them both to come and join him as soon as that becomes possible for them to do so. Uh, you know, maybe, perhaps they didn't have the funds. They were, we don't know the reasons why uh, they, they remained behind. But Paul does, I think, at the same time that he sends this instruction for Silas and Timothy to come and rejoin him as soon as is practicable, I believe at the same time he gives an instruction to Timothy to go himself back up to Thessalonica and check up on the church that was planted there. Because again, it can't, it's not like you can pick up the phone, get on FaceTime, Skype, Zoom, you know, send an instant message, even uh, sending a letter by mail. There wasn't like a regular mail service like we enjoy today. So there, you know, the, their ability to communicate with these people was much, much different than what we have today. And so Paul felt like a, a, that a first hand communication with them was something that was necessary. And so he sends Timothy back for a brief return to Thessalonica. Now that brings us back to the letter of 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, because verses 2 and 4 here in chapter 3 are going to tell us the purpose of Timothy's mission. Timothy sent on this mission, and Paul tells him, he says, We sent Timothy, our brother, God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith. So there is his mission right there, to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith, so that no one would be disturbed by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that we have been destined for this. Paul's concern, he, he always shows his concern for his spiritual children in the Lord, the people that he led to Jesus. He shows his concern for them in numerous letters in the New Testament, and, uh, and we see that here in 1 Thessalonians 3. His chief concern seems to focus on or center on the condition of their faith. So he sends Timothy up to check the vital signs, if you will. Go check the vital signs on the body of Christ in the city of Thessalonica 
And what we might see here is that faith is the first of these two vital signs that Timothy is sent by Paul uh, to assess. He says, and we sent Timothy, our brother and God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ. I, I want you to notice in that phrase how Timothy is, uh, how he's referred to. He's called our brother. You know, it's interesting, Paul, we, we tend to really look up to Paul, and for good reason, we tend to look up to Paul. But Paul doesn't look at Timothy as being somehow beneath him. He, he treats Timothy like he's a, he's a co-laborer, he's a co-worker. He, he doesn't treat him as someone that's somehow beneath him. He looks at him uh, as, as, a, as an equal in this ministry that they're on. Uh, he's, he's a fellow partner in that ministry. And so he calls him our brother, and he calls him God's fellow worker. The idea in that terminology there, God's fellow worker, is that of someone who works alongside of another for a common cause, working alongside of God. He says he's one of God's fellow workers. God's working, and Timothy's working alongside God in a common cause for your benefit. And so I think that's, that's really helpful for us to look at because sometimes we get uh, a little big shotism, if I could use that term, big shotism in the church where, you know, you got the big shots and you got the little shots and we're more focused on the big shots, the, the big name on the platform. But, but notice how Paul refers to Timothy. He calls him our brother, God's fellow worker. These are, this is interesting. He doesn't, notice what Timothy is not called. He's not called some kind of a big shot name. He's not called a pastor. He's actually presented here as a really good example for you and I of what God has called each and every one of his disciples of Jesus to be. And that is a co-labor, uh, one of God's fellow workers in his kingdom. See, Timothy, I think, is a really good example of what God would expect and, and, and what each and every one of us could be in the church, one of God's fellow workers. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter what your training is. You could be one of God's fellow workers, and God would just love it if you would be one of his fellow workers. He sends Timothy, his brother in the Lord, his co-laborer in the Lord, one of God's fellow workers in the Lord. He sends them, he sends him to the church in Thessalonica to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith, he says. Timothy's assignment is to strengthen and encourage their faith. Now strengthen, that word there means to make something stronger so that it's established and permanent. It's already there. It might already be in a strong place. It might already be in a good place. But he says, I want to strengthen it in such a way. I want to shore it up. If there's any weaknesses, I want to shore it up and make it established. In fact, that word established is a really good word uh, that we could use there to establish and encourage you as to your faith. That word encourage, I've defined it in the, you know, maybe last week or the week before I've, I've, uh, uh, defined it this way, that to encourage, it means to give someone or impart courage by coming alongside of them. You know, when you're going through a tough time or there's a scary moment and you find yourself being all alone, if not physically alone, then maybe emotionally alone, and it's really scary and there's uh, anxiety building inside of you, it can be encouraging just to have someone come alongside of you in that season, in that moment. Just someone coming alongside of you can give you the courage you need to help get you through that rough spot or to get you through that challenging season. And so he sends Timothy to encourage them, to strengthen them, so that no one would be disturbed by these afflictions. Now, afflictions here is the same word that was translated tribulation back in 1 Thessalonians 1.6. It's the Greek word thlipsis. Uh, strictly speaking, it means pressure, but it's describing the pressure that hostile opposition places upon a person's life. Hostility that comes against a person's life simply because they believe in Jesus, because they've given their heart to Jesus. Maybe there's pressure that comes upon that person's life through that hostility. That could come from a family member. It could come from someone that used to be a friend, someone that just doesn't like what God's doing in your life. And they start to put pressure on you. The word here, afflictions or tribulation, it speaks of pressure. 
Maybe you experience that, but you never come to identify it with what the Bible here is talking about. Maybe you've come, uh, come to experience that pressure when somebody who, you know, calls himself a friend, but, you know, really, are they that much of a friend when they're pressuring you to go out and get high with them, to go out and get drunk with them, to go out and do things that Jesus saved you out of? The things that would land you in jail, the things that would get you in trouble, and they're trying to get you back into it, and they're pressuring you to get you back into that. Is that really a friend, right? But you experience that pressure, and that's what they're undergoing. It, the, the, the kind of pressure that they were facing, it might be of a different, uh, a different variety, but it's that same kind of feeling of you're being pressured into something that you know you're not meant to do. They're being pressured to sacrifice a pinch of incense to the emperor to show their loyalty to the emperor. Uh, but, but in doing so, they're basically worshiping him as a god. And so there's pressure upon them to go and do these things. And that affliction made life very difficult for them to be a Christian. He says, I, I want to send Timothy up to you. He says, I sent him to you because I wanted him to strengthen your faith. I wanted him to shore up any kind of weaknesses that might be in your faith. I wanted him to encourage you by coming alongside of you because I don't want you disturbed by these afflictions. His concern, Paul's concern, was that the unrelenting pressure that these believers were enduring would cause their faith to weaken and if their faith were to be weakened, it would render that church's effectiveness inert. This was an effective church. He was encouraging them in chapter one. He says, news of your faith and your love and your hope, it's been going on, uh, it's been spreading from your city to other cities in your own province of Macedonia and also into neighboring provinces of Achaia where I'm at down in Corinth. He says, he says, people are hearing about what God's doing in you and how you're persevering and it's causing God to move in these other cities. They're hearing testimonies of you and it's encouraging and it's strengthening them. So I wanna make sure we keep this going. So I sent Timothy to strengthen and encourage you during your time of affliction, during that time of pressure. I don't want you to give in to that pressure. I don't want your faith to be weakened. He says, for you yourselves know that we have been destined for this. The Bible tells us and warns us that we're going to face pressure to do the wrong thing. We're going to face pressure to commit treason against Jesus. We're going to face pressure to do things that would harm our relationship with God. It's useful to remember Jesus' own words to us. He says in John 15, he says it a lot of places, but in John 15, 18, he says, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you are of the world, the world would love its own, but because you are not of the world, I chose you out of the world. Because of this, the world hates you. Verse 20, remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, he says, if they pressured me, if they put that, that hostility against me and they put me under pressure with this relentless hostility towards me, if they did that to me because of my relationship with my heavenly father, they're also gonna do that to you. He says, they will also persecute you. They're gonna put you under that pressure. They're gonna give you that hostility because of your relationship with me. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my namesake because they do not know the one who sent me. Now, it was Paul's pattern, you know, when he had evangelized an area and they planted churches and made disciples, it was his pattern established all the way back from the first missionary journey he had done years before. Uh, we read about it in Acts uh, chapters 13 and 14. Uh, that, in that missionary journey, they followed up through the towns that they, and the cities where they had planted churches and uh, retraced their steps. And look at the message that he gives them in verse 22. He says, strengthening the souls, the inner being, strengthening that, that emotional self, that the, the, the mind, will, and emotions, that soulish part of the disciples, and encouraging them, coming alongside them, giving them supernatural courage from God, to continue in the faith, say continue in the faith and saying through many tribulations, there's that word, flips us again, that pressure through much pressure, hostility, being pressured to, to do things to harm that relationship with God, 
Your faith is what's going to get you through those tribulations. And through those tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. He says, so I want to keep your faith strong because your faith is what's going to get you through that pressure. Your faith is going to keep you connected in relationship with God. And through those tribulations, though that pressure comes, your faith is going to keep you connected in relationship and you're going to experience God. You're going to experience his kingdom every day. And so it was his practice to follow up and, uh, and make sure that they were encouraged and strengthened. And so he's having to do that through Timothy here by sending Timothy back up to Thessalonica with this message and this mission. 1 Thessalonians 3, 4, For indeed, we were, uh, when we were with you, we kept telling you in advance that we were going to suffer affliction. And so it came to pass, as you know. He says, we're going to experience this. It's part of being a follower of Jesus. Verse 5 reveals the thinking behind his concern and what his thinking was behind sending Timothy on this mission. He says, for this reason, when I can endure it no longer, he says, man, I haven't had contact with these guys for a while now. And so when I could endure it no longer, I also sent to find out about your faith for fear that the tempter might have tempted you and our labor would be in vain. He says, I just couldn't stand it anymore. I had to, I had to find out what's going on. Remember, he can't just pick up the phone and call somebody. And so he sends Timothy on this mission. The Thessalonian believers were facing unrelenting pressure, nonstop hostility, this, this constant hostile opposition to Jesus. And his concern was that under that pressure, as their life is in this pressure cooker, that under that pressure, that the temptation would come to plunder them of their, their, their the tempter would come at, in, in one of those moments of pressure and that tempter would plunder them of their faith. Now, we kind of miss it in the English, but it, if I go into the Greek language here, the word here when it talks about the tempter and temptation, the word that's used there, it's, it's in the same family tree as the word from which we get our English word pirate. It's describing someone who's making an opportunistic attempt to plunder something. And so he says, my concern is this pressure hasn't let up on your life. It's been hard to be a follower of Jesus there. Your faith has been strong, but it's been hard to be a follower of Jesus. And my concern is that the tempter is going to seize an opportunity under that pressure to allow you a way out. But that way out's really a trap because it's going to harm your relationship with God. So he says, I want to come alongside and I want to see your, you, you encouraged and I want to see your faith shored up and strengthened if there's any weaknesses in it. Verse 6 brings us Timothy's report. And Paul was so glad to hear the good news that we read about in verse 6. He says, but now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us good news of your faith and love and that you always think kindly of us, longing to see us just as we also long to see you. Now, Acts 18.5 describes about how Timothy and Silas, they eventually do rejoin Paul down in Corinth, but it's probably several months uh, before that, uh, that report that we're reading about here in 1 Thessalonians 3.6 was given. Again, it's, it's uh, over 300 miles from where they're located, so it, it's not an inconsequential journey to get there. And so they had been uh, separated for some time. And so we can only imagine the joy of Paul of seeing Timothy and Silas again. Uh, the team is back together again. And then to hear this good news on top of it. Uh, the vital signs of the body of Christ in Thessalonica were good. Their faith was strong despite all the pressure of continuous hostile opposition. There was that constant pressure, but their faith remained strong. That tells me that our faith can stay strong even when there's nonstop daily pressure from those friends who want us to, to go out and party with them, that want us to bring us into the same mess that we got saved out of. It tells us that our faith can stay strong in the midst of all of that. It tells me our faith can stay strong no matter what season of life that we're in and that God wants to see our faith remain strong, despite all the opposition, despite all the hostility, despite all the pressure. The second thing we find out, the second vital sign we learn about here is that their love, say love, 
Their love was authentic and untainted by the hate directed against them. Think about this. The the hate that was directed against them was not producing hate within them. That's a healthy sign, church. That's what God wants to see. When the hate comes on us, that it does not produce hate in us. And that's what the world's trying to do. There is intense pressure right now to take the hate that's directed against us for whatever reason. It might have nothing to do with Jesus. It might have to do with our race. It might have to do with our family. It might have to do with the people we work with or whatever, that there's hate directed against us. But a true follower of Jesus learns how to walk by faith and not by sight. And as we walk by faith, the hate that's directed against us, we don't allow it to produce hate within us. Look what he says here. The vital signs of the body of Christ are good. Your faith is strong. Your love is authentic. It's untainted by the hate directed against them. And your attitude towards Paul and and the other people that helped invest in your life is one of affection and not of resentment. So the vital signs are good. This is a healthy, rapidly maturing church, despite the fact that it hasn't, that none of these people have been saved for a very long time. They haven't been followers of Jesus. They haven't been disciples of Jesus for very long. And that tells me something about spiritual maturity, that it's not a function of, of time. A person can be saved 40, 50 years, going to church every Sunday and still be a spiritual infant because they have a ritual with Jesus. They don't have a relationship with Jesus. These people had a real relationship with Jesus, and for that reason, their faith was strong and their love was authentic. Verse seven, verse actually, verses seven and eight tell us what comfort this brings and the response that this brings to Paul down in Corinth. He says, For this reason, brethren, in all our distress and affliction, it was distressing, and there's pressure on Paul, not hearing anything for weeks at a time, for months at a time about people he really cares about. And so in all his distress and affliction, his pressure, he says, we were comforted about you through your faith, for now we really live if you stand firm in the Lord. So Paul says, man, this this gave me so much encouragement and comfort to hear that the vital signs of faith and love in you are strong. You don't have any idea what a blessing you have been to me just to hear this news about you. And so we see the interconnectivity again of of, of our church family, our extended church family. Uh, The Message Bible paraphrase, I think it captures the heart of this passage well enough to, uh, to go ahead and read it here. It says in the Message Bible, but now that Timothy's back, bringing this terrific report on your faith and love, we feel a lot better. It's especially gratifying to know that you continue to think well of us and that you want to see us as much as we want to see you. In the middle of our our trouble and our hard times here, just knowing that you're doing good, just knowing how you're doing, it keeps us going. Knowing that your faith is alive it keeps us alive. Hey, there's, there's something to keep in mind when you're in quarantine. And you know what people's been praying for you? Hey, let them know that, hey, we're, we're doing good. God is good. He's with us. And let people know that, that have been praying for you, that have been investing in you. Let them know that, that they might be encouraged and that they might be strengthened so that they may pray and continue to invest in you and in other people. You see the interconnectivity that, that, that Paul is experiencing in the extended church family, the body of Christ. In verse 9, Paul praises God for what he's doing in the Thessalonian believers. He just is kind of like this little outburst of praise here. He says, For what thanks can we render to God for you in return for all the joy with which we rejoice before God on your account? Uh, news of their uh, spiritual health, the healthy vital signs up there in the north in Thessalonica, it's producing an outburst of praise down 300 miles south in Corinth. And since praise brings the presence of God, and since wherever God's presence manifests, God's stuff happens, we can see the ripple effects from the Thessalonians' faith and love that was impacting the spiritual atmosphere in Corinth. And so in verse 10, Paul tells us Uh, what he's been praying specifically with regards to the Thessalonians. He says, night and day, 
As night and day, we keep praying most earnestly that we might see your face and complete what is lacking in your faith. He says, we want to come up for a visit. We want to see you face to face. It was great hearing about you, but that just makes me want to see you all the more. His desire to return to them is is undiminished by this good report. Rather, I think it's probably been intensified by this report. And hearing that they're doing good is is something that's just, I think it's got Paul bursting at the seams, wanting to go back and visit them. He says, strengthening them further than they've already been strengthened. He says, "I I want to see your faith, though it's healthy right now, I want to see it strengthened even further that we might strengthen whatever's lacking in your faith. He says, if there's any holes in your faith, if there's any weaknesses in those pillars of faith, I want to see them get shored up. Uh, the, The words that he's using here describes someone patching up any holes that there might be in something. The last segment of the chapter is verses 11 to 13, where Paul now just, he he begins to pray, tell him, this is what I'm praying for you. And he makes request to God for three things. And so I want to use our our remaining time this morning to break down these three uh, prayer requests that Paul makes to the Lord. Because the the tone kind of changes here. He's no longer talking to the Thessalonians, telling them, you know, about how he's been praying for them. But he shifts here. Look at verse 11. He says, he shifts here when he says, now may our God and Father himself and Jesus our Lord direct our way to you. See, it, it now it's as though Paul is praying and he's letting them come into his prayer room with him. He says, may, the God, may our God and Father himself and Jesus our Lord direct our way to you. And may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people just as we also do for you. So that he may establish your hearts without blame in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Three prayer requests. Let's look at these one at a time. Request number one, he says that the Lord would direct his way to them. He says, may the Lord direct our way back to you. That shows me something I think really useful. Christians, let's look at this for a second. He says, he really wants to return for a visit. He's made that abundantly clear so far in the letter. He really wants to go back and visit them. But notice how he submits that, that fervent desire to the custody of the Lord Jesus. He says, may the Lord direct our way to you. I think that shows us something useful for our prayer life. May Jesus direct our way to you. I really want to do this, but may the Lord bring it about. Paul's prayer gives us a great example to follow. Look at this. He says, may the Lord direct our way to you. You know, how often do our prayers consist of us trying to get God to do what we want done? How often do our prayers consist of us trying to direct God's way? God, I want you to do this. I'd like you to do it in this way, and I'd like it done by such and such a time. I wonder what it would look like if, if for us to be directed by God to his way. Lord, direct me. I, I feel a leading in this direction. I, I pray that you would bring it about. His heart is to have fellowship and relationship with God. And out of that relationship with God, we come to know his heart. And as he communicates his heart to us, when we pray, we have his will. His will's been communicated heart to heart. We know what God wants done. And so he's, he's given it to us to pray it, to speak it, to believe it. He's given it to us. Why don't you ask me for this? And we say it. We ask him, Lord, I believe you're putting it in my heart to request this for so-and-so. I believe you're putting this on my heart to request for this. And when we bring that request, he answers those prayers. Why? Because he's directing us into the path that he wants us to walk in. It's not us trying to direct God into the path we want him to do. We're submitted to his lordship. You know, in Psalm 37, 23, in the New Living Translation, it says, The Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their lives. The Lord directs the steps of the godly. See, when we're in fellowship and relationship with God and we're close to him, we can count on it. He's going to direct our steps. I'm coming to learn more and more in life that, 
coincidences just, you know, quite often something that looks like a coincidence. It's something that God has set up. And I'm learning to be sensitive. Lord, are you directing my steps here? Are you directing my purpose here? Did you arrange for me to be in this place at this time for this purpose? And then I come into that prayer and say, God, I need further instructions here, but I, I sense that you're doing something here. Direct me, direct my path here. And Psalm 37, 23 says, I can count on it that the Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their lives. That's good. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Everyone knows this, I think. Uh, I hear this one get quoted a lot. A lot of times it finds its way on uh, graduation announcements and whatnot. But I like how the New Living Translation says it. It says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all that you do, and he will show you which path to take. So often we start at the end of this and we don't do the first two things. So often in the end we say, God, I, I, I'm at a crossroads here. I need to know which path to take. Direct my path. But we don't start with trust in the Lord with all my heart. We don't start with die to yourself. Come into relationship with him. Come to know his heart with all of your heart. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Start there. Find out what his heart is saying. Find out what is on his mind. Come to know the character of your God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't depend on all your understanding. So many times we depend on our own understanding. We trust in ourselves. We have our own plan. We know what we want to do. But we come to the fork in the road and all of a sudden we're uncertain. We don't really care about God's will. We, we have our own will. We have, I have my plan. This is what I want from my life. But I've reached a fork in the road. So I need God's help to direct me to fulfill my own will. And that doesn't work, folks. That's not what this verse is saying. What this verse is saying is die to yourself. Come to an end of yourself. Put yourself entirely in the custody of Christ's care and control. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Submit your whole being to him. Don't depend on your own understanding. God, I used to think like this. I need you to renew my mind because the way I understand things, it was warped and corrupt. I need you to change it so that I think like you. I don't want to depend on my own understanding. And when I start to depend on his understanding, his way of thinking, and I'm seeking his will in everything I do, God, what do you want out of me today? Every single day I approach him with that kind of a mindset and that kind of an attitude, I can depend on it. He's going to show me that day which path to take. I can count on it every time. He's concerned about every detail of our lives. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do. He'll show you which path to take. So he says, God, I, I pray that you would direct my path to them. I believe that I'm meant to return to Thessalonica and strengthen and encourage their faith and invest in their lives further. But I want that return to be directed by you. And so he submits that to Christ's care and control. Number two, his second prayer request is that the Lord would cause them to increase and abound in love. He says, may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love. Now, what's described here is a cascading exponential growth. Now, what I mean by that is when it increases, it triggers another effect that causes it to increase again and again and again. And so there's this explosive growth. Uh, if I could leave you with a picture, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preface this by saying don't do this in your house. But if you've never done this before, you get a two liter bottle of, of diet soda, preferably like Diet Coke or Diet Pepsi. Uh, because the ingredients are in there. Again, do this outside. Do not do this indoors. Get one of those big two liters and open that thing up. Let the fizz settle. Take one of those Mentos candies. Uh, the, the mint Mentos, I think, work best. And drop it in the neck of that bottle and get out of the way quick. Because it's it starts a chemical reaction that causes it to just burst. It, it causes it to fizz, and the fizz causes more fizz, which causes more fizz. And so there's this cascading effect that causes the bottle to erupt in fizz. Half the bottle can come out of there. If you get a tube of paper and you dump, I've never been able to get more than four in at a time before the explosive force uh, causes that you can't dump any more Mentos in. It's already erupting out the neck of the bottle. 
Uh, but I've seen, uh, the, I've seen the eruptions go as high as 10, 15 feet. So um, it's substantial. But that's kind of a picture that, that describes what he's describing here when he says, may the Lord cause you to increase. No, may he cause you to abound in his love. Now, he says, may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love. So the, it is the Lord that causes this inner growth to be possible. It's him that makes this possible. See, I can only abound and increase in what I receive from him. And so it's the Lord that causes that growth and increase in his love. And the Lord can only cause us to abound and increase in what we are willing to receive by faith. I think so many Christians hold God's love at arm's length and do not receive his love. They, they kind of push back and don't receive his love because they fear that they are not worthy of it because they're consumed by thoughts of guilt and shame from their past and they feel like, uh, no, I'm not worthy of that yet. And so they hold him at arm's length thinking at some point through some sort of religious performance, I'll someday be worthy of his love. But the bottom line is, no, you're never going to be more worthy than you are now. The point is you're never going to attain to it. You're never going to really be worthy of it. He doesn't mean you to be worthy of it. He simply means for you to receive it in your unworthy, shame and guilt stained state. Drop your guard and receive his love. Put down the barriers and receive his love. By faith, receive these two things. He loves you. He gave himself up for you. You matter to him. By faith, receive this, this truth that you have been chosen and you are loved by God. Passionately loved by by God. Receive those two truths. And just as we receive anything, the, the only way we can receive anything from God is by faith. So by faith, receive those two things. And the love that we receive begins to change us and shape us and it increases in us and then it super bounds through us so that the love that God has lavished on us, we begin to show to other people and lavish on to other people. And God's love then begins to impact the world. Because who often is the face of God's love? Quite often, it's another person who's received his love. And all of us can be one of those people. God would have each of us be one of those people who has received God's love, who now is a conduit, a pipeline of God's love for one another, he says. I believe God would have us, when he says that you would increase and abound in love for one another, I believe that God would have us to experience for other people what he experiences and feels for them. What would happen if we would feel for other people a taste of the love that God would feel for them? What would that look like? That's what he's talking about here. That's what changes the world. That's the gospel. That's the good news is that it doesn't matter what your past is. God loves you. He chose you. He already paid your debt. I believe God would have us to experience for other people what he feels for them. And a true vital sign of spiritual growth is revealed in our level of authentic God-given love for other people. He says, may you increase and abound in love for one another. So that which we receive, God causes to increase. And then like the, that, that Coke that's just spraying out of that bottle, just super abound towards other people. He says, may you increase and abound in love, not just for one another, but for all people. There's something really important here. The other people he's talking about here, when he says for one another, he's really talking about fellow followers of Jesus, fellow Christians. But when he says for all people, May you increase and abound in love for one another and for all people. He means everybody who's not yet a follower of Jesus. Everyone who's not yet a Christian. Now, in the context of Thessalonica, this is a, a place where these people had been persecuted for what they believed. They were suffering intense pressure upon their lives to reject this Jesus. They were experiencing a lot of hostility. They were experiencing a lot of pressure and a lot of hate. 
And so for the Thessalonians, when he says, may you increase and abound in love for one another and for all people, the people that he says here, these, these all people, they're actually the face of that hostile opposition. What would happen if we became the conduits of God's love for those that directed hate and pressure and hostility towards us? What if our response was more like God's response to us when we were hateful and we were hostile to him? Oh, pastor, I wasn't hateful toward God. I wasn't hostile toward him. Yes, you were. You don't realize how hostile you were to him. When you read the Bible and you look at God's standards, you look at his heart and you look at the things that you did and you're really honest with yourself, you find out you are deeply hostile to this God who lavishes his love upon you. How did he handle you? Look at, look at how we want to handle the people who direct hate toward us. What do we want to do? L- look at what I see people doing. I see them. Let, let's expose them. Let's, let's make them look hateful to everyone. Let's make them look as bad as we can possibly make them look bad because hate is wrong. You're right. Hate is wrong. But did God treat you that way when you were full of hate? How did he treat you? We should boycott this place because they did this and this and this was hateful. Is that how God treated you? Well, how do we change? How did God treat you? I'm going to keep coming back to that. How did he treat you? How did God show his love for you? That's what he wants us to do to those that put the pressure and the hate upon us. He wants us to respond with his love and not respond and not allow their hate against us produce hate within us. He wants us to show the same love to them that we've received from him. Whether they receive it from us or not, that's that's their part. God couldn't make us receive his love any more than you can make someone receive his love directed through you. We can't make them receive it, but we can be constant conduits of his love. He says, may that love of God increase and superabound in your life for one another in the church, fellow Christians, your extended church family, and for all people. Let's abound in the love of God. That's what draws people to come to Christ, is the love of God that, that, is, that they experience and that they see functioning in and through people, average, everyday people, just like you and I. He says, for all people, show that love. May, may you increase and be able to show that love even to your persecutors man he says thirdly and we'll be concluding with this uh he says may the lord establish your hearts i wish i had more time to develop this uh, because i could spend a lot of time talking about a heart but i'm just going to make this simple this morning he he prays that the lord would establish your hearts He, he, he prays may the lord direct my path to you May the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people. And thirdly, may the Lord establish your hearts. Now, when he says heart, he means that soulish inner part of us. That part of us that's not physical. It's our innermost being. It's that part of us that before we were redeemed and before we were adopted by God into his family, that part of us was thoroughly corrupt. Look what it says in Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10. So when people come to me and tell me, oh, I've always known who God is. I I, I come back to Jeremiah 79, where it says, the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? Oh, he's got a good heart, pastor. He doesn't know Jesus yet, but he's got a good heart. What does the scripture say here? The heart is more deceitful. Deceitful. Your own heart can deceive you into thinking that you are in a right place with God and you're in a good place with God when you're not. The heart is more deceitful than all and it's desperately sick. Who can understand it? Your heart's in a bad place. That innermost being is in a desperately sick place and it's so bad that the Bible doesn't describe God as healing our heart so much as it describes him giving us a new heart. He says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind to give to each man according to his ways, according to the result of his deeds. So God's going to give you according to your heart. Is it going to be according to the heart that's deceitful above all else and desperately wicked? 
or is it going to be according to what the, the Bible calls a new heart? He says that he may establish your hearts. When he says establish your hearts, one of the key things that, that accompanies our salvation experience is that God gives us a new heart. Say the new heart. He gives us a new heart. He doesn't fix up our old one. He replaces it. He gives us a new heart. And what that means is it means an inner change that directs the course of our life. You see, the condition of our heart directs the course in which I live my life. And so when he changes our heart from the one that was deceitful and corrupt and desperately wicked, the one that I can't really even understand why I do what I do, he changes it. He takes that and he, he, he removes that heart of stone and he gives me a new heart. He gives me a change. There's a change that takes place on the inside. He gives me a new heart that changes the whole course of my life from one of hostility towards the one who made me, towards my creator, into a, a new course that's one of fellowship and relationship and knowing this God who made me, even in my mother's womb. Ezekiel 36, verses 26 and 27, talk about how he'll take away this old heart of stone and he gives us a new heart. Uh, Psalm 51, 10 tells us about God giving us a clean heart. He, he restores something inside us that was desperately wicked and broken. John 3, 3 and, and John 3, 5 describe this new birth experience. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 calls it a, being made into a new creation. Old things have passed away, new things are come. And what Paul is praying here is that this new heart experience that you've had, may you be established in that new heart place that God has, has brought you by faith in Jesus. May he establish your hearts. In other words, may he shore it up and strengthen it that your heart may not be removed from the course that he set you on, which is following him. 1 John 3, 21 talks, us, it talks about this, and it tells us amazing consequence of this new heart experience. It says, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. If our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. You realize what God is saying here? He wants you to have confidence before him. So with that new heart, he gives us confidence in him. And Paul is praying, may you be established and strengthened so that you may live life every day with confidence in your relationship with God. Paul's prayer here is that God would establish their hearts. It's his fervent desire that this heart change would be permanent. And it's something that only God can do. May God establish your heart. You can't do it through some kind of religious performance. Man, we covered that in the book of Galatians. No, he says, I want you to live with this, this spiritual confidence and may it rest entirely in what God is doing. And may the work that God started, may he, he shore it up, establish it, and strengthen you in it. And this is brought about in a partnership with God when joined by faith on our part. May God establish your hearts without blame. What does he mean by that? I believe that God wants for us to be able to live life free of guilt and shame over our pre-Jesus past. He doesn't want us constantly reminding ourselves of our past and, and all the bad things. All that does is put up a wall and it, may, it actually encourages us to reject his love and pull away from him. Shame and guilt and all that that comes with it makes us pull away from him. And God wants us to draw near unto him. He wants our hearts to be established without blame. He wants us to be able to live the course of our life blame-free, without blame, free of guilt and shame over our past. Because think about it. How can any of us have a relationship, an authentic relationship with anyone with whom we have a guilty conscience? He says, may God establish your hearts without blame. Paul's prayer is that they would be brought into a yet even more intimate relationship with their loving Heavenly Father. He says, in holiness, may God establish your hearts in holiness. Now, holiness, there's a lot I could say about it, but I want to just make it, I want to break it down to these essentials, okay? When you see holiness, I want you to think a couple of things. I want you to think free of all corruption, in its most literal sense, it means set apart. But when you think about it, something that is free of all corruption has been set apart. Go into a clean room in a hospital. 
Look at sterilized tools. They are set apart for a purpose. They're free of all corruption. And that's what God has meant for you. When he gave you that new heart, he wants that new heart to be established in holiness, set apart for a unique purpose that is free of all corruption. He wants the course of our life to be free of all corruption and set apart for the purpose for which he saved us, for the the purpose for which he made us and put us on this earth. And thirdly, I want you to think set apart for a unique and intimate relationship. Unique and intimate relationship. Only you can have the relationship with God that you have. Your relationship with God is unique to you and him. My relationship with God is unique to him and myself. He says, may God establish your heart and your heart directs the course of your life. May he establish your heart in such a way that you live life free of corruption. May you live this life set apart for that God-given purpose that you're not pulled aside from the purpose for which he made you and gave you that new heart. And may your life's course be established in such a way that you never depart from that intimate and unique relationship for which he made you to enjoy with him and him with you. Now, we're all standing at the message this morning, but I want, to, I want to remind you something that's really essential here, and that is that all of this that we've talked about here, all of this is made possible only by the shed blood of Jesus in advance on our behalf of our life. On behalf of your life, before you were even born. So before your life and on behalf of your life, Jesus suffered all of the punishment that your guilt, the guilt and the blame and the shame that you try to carry, he took all of that upon himself. There's no need to carry that load. And so he tells us, come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest for your souls. Why? Because he wants to see your heart established without blame in holiness, free of all of the corruption so that you can enjoy the purpose and the relationship for which he made you in the first place. If you've never encountered Jesus Christ, you you don't have what we're describing here, boy, you can start right now, and it's so easy. It's so easy to start. You start by telling God, I am a mess. My life is out of control. I'm a sinner. I've got all this guilt. I've got all this shame. I don't know what to do with it, and I need your help, God. So just admit to him your need for him. And then admit to him, hey, God, I know that you exist. I believe that you exist. I believe that I matter to you and I believe that you have the power to put me on this course that Pastor Joel's talking about in holiness, free of corruption, free of all of this weight of guilt and shame and blame. And and, and I, I feel like I'm not living according to my purpose. I don't have a relationship with you, but I want to. I believe that I matter to you. And so this day, I commit my life and all my cares and all my worries and all my guilt and all my past, I commit it to your hands because you said for me to come to you if I'm weary and heavy laden and that you give me rest for my soul. I want to experience what Pastor Joel's talking about here. I want to experience you in relationship and I I want to live the purpose for which you made me and for which you sent Jesus to die for me. I believe in you and I ask you to change me. And give me that new heart right now. Take away my heart of stone and give me that new heart that that, that Pastor Joel is talking about here. That new heart that the Bible describes as being a new creation where all the old things have passed away. I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Well, I want to take our final moments this morning and talk about what does this passage tell us about the return of Jesus? Because every chapter of 1 Thessalonians has something to say about the return of Jesus Christ. And so what do we learn here about this? Now, I want to say something about the return of Jesus. He is returning for each of us, and it's going to happen in one of two ways, but he does return for every single person who belongs to him. Everyone who has received that new heart, he's coming for them. Now, he might come for me when my when I take my last breath in this body or if I were to suddenly uh, collapse of a heart attack or something. Uh, in that moment, the, the minute that this body would cease to function, I would immediately transition to be with him. He would come for me in that sense. But there's another coming that we're talking about where those who are alive and remain are caught up together to be with him and never be separated from him ever again. And that's the reunion we talked about at the close of last week's message. 
Well, what do we learn about this coming of Jesus here in verse 13? He talks about how uh, uh, the coming of the Lord Jesus is going to be accompanied by his saints. Look at what it says. It says, so that he may establish your hearts without blame in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all of his saints. Jesus is coming with all of his saints. Now, that word saints tends to throw us a little bit because we tend to think super Christian, right? Some kind of superhero version of a believer in Jesus or a Christian. Uh, but it actually, the word there actually literally means and simply means holy ones, holy ones. Now, what do we just get done talking about? That he may establish your hearts without blame in holiness and when he comes, those who have already transitioned to be with him, who he's already come for, is going to be coming back with him. Jesus' return is accompanied by people who were made holy by God, whose hearts were established and without blame in holiness. Now, I don't believe these saints are angels. Some people might try to make that case. I don't believe that they're angels. No, these are redeemed people. This is the reunion that we were talking about last week. And so what I believe that God is saying to us this morning is this. He is preparing us for Jesus' return for us. God's preparing us right now for his return for us. And so what God is doing in our life right now to establish our hearts without blame in holiness right now that is preparing us right now for his coming. Those who are returning with him are the same people who were established without blame in holiness before their departure from this life. What God's doing in your life right now, be patient with it and be complicit with it. Allow God to do what he is doing. Allow God to strengthen you. Allow him to encourage you in your faith. Allow him to, to take you through this time of pressure, this time of suffering, this time of affliction. Allow him to bring you through this storm because in the middle of this storm, I'm speaking to you, church, in the middle of this storm, God is establishing something in your hearts. He's strengthening something in your hearts and he's preparing you. He's getting you ready to transition to life everlasting in his presence where you'll never be separated from him ever again. He's preparing us for his return. He's preparing us right now for his coming. I want to be ready for him, don't you? So let's be a church that has healthy vital signs. Let's allow God to strengthen our faith. Let's allow God, even in the middle of this season that might be very difficult, a lot of pressure, let's allow God to strengthen our faith and increase us in our love so that we super abound in love for one another, for everyone. When hate is directed towards us or towards people we care about, let's respond with the love of God. Let's respond how Jesus responded to us when we hated on him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this day for your word. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for hope. We thank you for life everlasting that we're experiencing now, but there's yet more coming. I pray that you would indeed cause us to grow in faith. I pray that you would uh, help us to grow and superabound in your love. Let us remember this message when we face the pressure, when we face the test, that we would not use or uh, allow the hate that's directed against us for whatever reason produce any hate in us, but allow us, Lord, to be conduits of your love, that the love that we have received from you could flow from us into other people as well. May people encounter your love through your church, and I pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Well, God bless you and keep you. We'll see you again here next Sunday. Take care.